Okay. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Plants for Resilient Lawns. We're excited to have you guys here with us tonight. My name is Moira Swanson. I am a current I am a current AmeriCorps member serving with the Conservation Nebraska. I am here tonight with Dr. Ron Seymour, an Adams County Extension educator. First, I would like to cover just some general housekeeping things. Um, this is a live event and it will be recorded and posted to Conservation Nebraska's YouTube channel with closed captions at a later date. Do not worry though, your video and microphone is off so no one can hear or see you currently right now. Um, that being said, we still do want to hear from you though. Um, we're going to be asking questions throughout this event and are here to answer any of those questions that you also have that come up throughout the event too. We're going to be doing different polls and things. Um, take some time to get familiar with the bottom icons on your screen. There's a chat option and a Q&A option. <clears throat> Tonight we're mostly going to be using the Q&A option. Um, if you have any questions, please drop them in the Q&A and we will try to answer them as best as we can. If this is your first time attending an event with us, Conservation Nebraska is a nonprofit organization that works to increase awareness of Nebraska's natural legacies, our air, water, and soil. Like I said before, my name is Moira Swanson. I was born and raised here in Nebraska, and I have a passion for serving my community members, and I am incredibly grateful to be able to help put this event together for you guys today. Um, with that being said, I'm going to pass things off to Ron Seymour. Ron is an extension educator located in Adam, Adams County, County, Nebraska. Like I said before, he's a cropping systems extension educator with an emphasis on corn and soybean production. Ron also works extensively in crop pest management with specific expertise in insect issues. He and his team have created this presentation that will help you walk away hopefully with a new perspective on what it means to have a healthy lawn. Are we ready? Yep, we're ready, Ron. All right. Good evening, everyone. I am so happy that I was invited to uh, partake, participate in this program and to give some information that um, I think is really important for us and for the people of Nebraska. And um, while I'm a crops specialist, uh, an entomologist, um, I am working very hard to uh, provide uh, habitat for beneficial organisms in our cropping systems. And um, so you may ask, well, how does somebody talk about lawns when they do crops? Well, I'm really very interested in um, parallels between what we do in people's lawns and what happens in our environment. And so some of the things that I'm going to be talking about tonight are parallel to what we're planning on talking about in cropping systems, just in the appropriate venue and with the appropriate plants that go along with that. And everybody has a stake in improving our environment. And um, because it is important for our future. And so uh, today I'm gonna to be talking about um, resilient lawns and um, we'll take a look and see. Uh, I have a PowerPoint presentation, but as Moria uh, suggested, there are, there's participation here on your part. And so please, when there are questions, please answer those questions and then we'll get a sense of how this, uh, whether you find some of these things important or not. So I'm just gonna go ahead and share my screen with my presentation and I will go through that. And um, so, as I mentioned, we're going, we're going to be doing this on resilient lawns and I'll be talking about various parts of that. And so this is, um, actually this is my house looking down my street. And as you can see, um, my wife and I work really hard to have a resilient lawn and we're going to improve it. That was part of the impetus for me doing this presentation is to learn more. 
And so today or tonight, we're going to talk, start out talking about lawn grasses because I think most people have grass in their lawns. But um, if you don't, you might be familiar with some of the things that are coming up. But the idea here is to talk about how can we um, pick the right lawn grasses where appropriate, minimize the maintenance of our lawns because I think time is at a premium for everyone. And then um, talk about some specific lawn types, mixed species, bee and flower lawns, and then finish up with some ground cover lawns. And so um, I, uh, I like to use lots of pictures as I go through this. It helps illustrate um, what we're doing. So the first thing I have here is a question. So when is grass appropriate or preferred? And if you'll go ahead and mark a, B, C, D, or E, so aesthetics, whether it's never appropriate, or if you have plets, pets that you need places for them to play, if you have children that need to have a place to play, or if you're doing athletic activities. So if anyone uh, would wanna go ahead and vote, looks like they cannot vote, right? Oh, hosts and panelists cannot vote, so. All right, if you wanna go ahead and mark your choices, that'd be great. Are you getting votes in, Maura? Maura? Yes, I am. Okay. We're almost there. Perfect. Thank you. I think you're just, okay. All right. Ready to move on? Yep. And then it should have the results. Shared. Oh, there we go. The results. Yeah. All right. I appreciate that. That's very good because those are reasons to have grass and grass does have a place in our landscapes. And um, I would uh, like people to think about what kind of grass and where is it appropriate. And so, um, Maria, if, Mara, if you wanna go ahead and close that and then we'll go to the next frame. Okay, here's the next question. So if we're gonna have grass, what type of grass should we have? And I have uh, seven different types of grass that we can grow here in easily in Nebraska. And um, so if you'll go ahead and mark these, it'll give me a sense of where we're at. And um, we'll be talking about some of these, not all, but some of these as we go along. So if everybody would choose um, A through G, That'd be great. <clears throat> now, some of you may have never heard about some of these grasses. So, ah, there's a good contingency for buffalo grass. Very nice. Um, looks like people are not familiar maybe with fine leaf fescue. And so we can talk about that. And um, interesting about the Kentucky bluegrass, that is the most common lawn grass that we have growing in landscapes in Nebraska. All right, so we'll go ahead with the next slide here. All right, so I just wanted to make sure we cover and get all on the same page about what these different grasses are. And um, so I don't have all of them listed here. These are the main types. And as I mentioned, Kentucky bluegrass is uh, the main one that we have. Uh, fine leaf fescue is not used particularly common, but it's commonly, but it certainly has its place. And turf type tall fescue is pretty common and, um, but not used as much. And then we, those are all cool season grasses, meaning that they warm up or they green up in March and about mid-March, and then they will stay green um, if watered throughout the growing season until usually 
about mid-November, whereas warm season grasses such as buffalo grass and blue grama grass are, uh, they don't, they, they're starting to green up now. And uh, so they'll be nice and green by about the first part of May. And then they start to go dormant about mid-September. And so just a little bit about those two grasses. And so let's take a look at some of these grasses. And I know that you're familiar with them, but it just gives us a basis for, for comparison. So this is a uh, Kentucky bluegrass lawn right here. And um, it um, fine, fine blades, uh, people tend to like that. It's soft and easy to walk on, um, but, uh, and it looks very nice. And it's um, very, fairly well adapted to Nebraska conditions, um, as long as it's kept well watered. All right, so uh, the next one, this is the fine leaf fescue. And um, as you can see, it has a fine leaf, just like Kentucky bluegrass. Um, tends to not be as stiff as Kentucky bluegrass. And um, it is much more shade tolerant than any of the other grasses that we can grow in Nebraska. And so if you have a shady location, this is a really good choice. Um, and um, so it does have its place. It does mix well with uh, Kentucky bluegrass uh, because it does have a number of the same needs. All right, this one is turf type tall fescue. And um, as you'll notice on the right there, the, the blades are a little bit wider than what we've been seeing. Um, but here on the left, I don't know that you would really be able to, to detect the difference in the landscape, particularly if you have all, um, uh, all fescue. And Fescue and, and bluegrass are a little bit different type of grass. Uh, fescues are what's called bunch grasses. They grow in bunches. Um, and then Kentucky bluegrass is a, uh, a rhizomous grass that makes a turf. And, uh, but uh, they can all, both look nice. All right. So I think a lot of people shy away from fescues because they think about pasture fescues, which is number one here on the list on the left. And they have a coarse blade and they're very sturdy grasses. They work really great for livestock feed, but not so well for a lawn. Whereas these turf type tall fescues, much narrower blade, much nicer to walk on and easier to take care of. All right, the other one that I really like to highlight is buffalo grass. And, um, Buffalo grass is a native grass to Nebraska. The others are not. Um, those are introduced uh, from primarily from Europe. Um, and then, but buffalo grass is native here. And you can see here on the right, as it looks by itself, so you can get a look at what the blades look like, what the plant stature looks like. And then here on the left, this is a lawn of buffalo grass. And I would challenge pe people to think whether that looks good or not. I love the looks of buffalo grass. It, um, it's a really good grass for Nebraska and for the Great Plains in general. All right, so those are the grasses. So I just wanted to ask a question about what's the most common resource directed to maintaining bluegrass? So um, in particular, so if people want to go through that, these are things that if you're going to maintain a bluegrass lawn, you're going to be using these resources. And there are others, but these are the main ones.
Ah, uh, yes, you are correct. So in, in the United States, lawns consume 3 trillion gallons of water a year. That's a lot of water. And in communities like Hastings, Grand Island, 70 to 80% of the capacity of the water service is to water lawns. It's an awful lot that we are dedicating to that resource. And the other pieces are important too. Um, we put a lot of fertilizer on to keep bluegrass alive. Um, and we mow it a lot. Every, if, you, if you think about that every week or more, that's a lot of gasoline. And there are other like things that we do like trimming and um, aeration. There's a lot of things that we're using gasoline. And then of course, pesticides are important. 70 million pounds of pesticide a year are applied on lawns in the United States. So quite a bit of input there. All right, so I'm gonna go on to the next one here. All right, so I just wanted to look at this fertilizer requirements between the different types of grasses. So here on the left are most of the types of grasses that we just discussed. And so we have improved Kentucky bluegrass, which are the kinds that they use on sports and athletic fields. Um, uh, we have a common uh, Kentucky bluegrass, the second one here, where more people have them on their lawns. I have perennial ryegrass, that's not a common grass to use, but some people use it to get things started. Finely fes or tall fescues, finely fescues, some zoysia grass, which is a warm season grass, and then buffalo grass and blue grama. So let's look at the different needs for these. So when we look at uh, bluegrass, you know, these improved bluegrasses need a lot more nitrogen, three to six pounds per thousand square feet. It's quite a bit of fer fertilizer, uh, common bluegrass is less, um, tall fescue. This is, if, you're, if you want a cool season grass, I really love having tall fescue. In fact, that's the basis of my lawn is tall fescue, one to four pounds. And so you can do quite a bit less fertilizer and keep it looking very nice. These fine leaf fescues, um, about the same as tall fescue. And then when we look at these warm season grasses, very little. Uh, nitrogen is needed for these. And um, so it's uh, very important to think about that uh, I don't really need to fertilize a buffalo grass or blue grama lawn or a combination of buffalo and blue grama. Uh, you couldn't combine zoysia grass very well with much of anything because it's very invasive. And then one thing to keep in mind about this, some of the variation in this range is whether you return your clippings or not to the lawn, whether you're mulching them right into the lawn, that is what I do. And the standard is, is that you will save a pound of nitrogen per thousand square feet for, uh, by returning your clippings to the lawn, just mulching them. They don't stay on the lawn very long and they, they, they mulch right in. And so it saves a significant um, amount of nitrogen with that um, by returning the clippings. All right. So we use a lot of, as we, we uh, covered, we use a lot of water to grow these different types of grass. And bluegrass and tall fescue, depends on the time of the year, on how much water you should be applying. So in the spring and fall, um, when it's cooler, three quarters of an inch per week. Um, and then when it gets hot, and usually about May is when people start ramping things up and water at one to one and a half inches per week through the end of September. So through the hotter part of the year. And then of course that's to keep this green. That's what I say to maintain green growth. Now look at tall fescue and fine leaf fescues. Significantly less, about half the amount of water because they, they have a deeper root system and they are much more drought tolerant. Uh, they are not drought immune, but um, they are drought tolerant. And then when we look at buffalo grass and blue grama, we even drop it less, a quarter inch every two weeks in the growing season. And some of these amounts of water could be applied by, uh, received by natural rainfall. 
And so we should always keep in mind how much rain it, um, it, that we received and then reduce the amount of water that we're applying on a lawn based on that rainfall. And um, I know here at the City of Hastings, the utilities department will provide you a, a, a sprinkler system shutoff system so that if it rains a certain amount, it'll shut the system on off for uh, one time and then it'll come back on. And so that's a really handy way to limit the amount of water you're applying based on what the, the circumstances have been. Now, another thing to consider is whether you can let your lawn go dormant or not. And these cool season grasses, when it gets hot in the middle of the summer, if they don't have enough water to stay green, they will actually go dormant. And in a dormant state, Kentucky bluegrass is very drought tolerant and can survive very well. Um, it just will make it brown, as you can see in the photo here. And you know they're watering the tree because the tree needs the water. The, and it'll green up underneath the grass. And anytime you get a little bit of rain, the bluegrass will start to green up again. It will need just a little water, but you know, a quarter inch every two weeks, uh, that's, that's not very much. And then you know, fescue, it's very drought tolerant, but if you let it go dormant, it, it could die. And so you do want to always, if you have a fescue in your lawn, you do always want to give it a little water through a particularly dry period. Usually we get enough rain, but there are some droughty periods like last year here in Hastings. It was dry enough that the fescue needed a little water. And then buffalo grass, it does need some water periodically too. And if we're in a severe drought, you know, a quarter inch of water once a month, will help it get through a droughty period. Usually we get enough rainfall even during a drought to keep our buffalo grass surviving, but um, it does need a little bit. Okay, so I wanna move on a little bit to uh, some pest management in these, uh, in these different types of turf grasses. And these are some of the common pests that we see. Um, and these um, are found in Nebraska. And so we have these bill bugs, um, beetle larvae or grubs. Um, sod webworms are a, a, a moth larvae that feeds on the surface. And then armyworm is another um, moth larvae that feeds on the leaf blades. And we can have problems with these periodically. Um, and some of these are every year, like particularly in the Eastern part of the state, we get bill bugs every year. And then across Nebraska, we get uh, beetle, these beetle grubs, either mass chafers or June beetles every year. And then we get sod webworms pretty often as well. So let's look at the number of insects and dis plant diseases that we get on these different types of grasses. And you can see here on the left, all of the insects on the top here that affect bluegrass. And we, we saw some of them, but uh, we have all these. And then there are quite a few diseases that are affecting the, the Kentucky bluegrass. Whereas tall and finally fescues have significantly fewer insect pests and fewer disease problems. But diseases can be important to, particularly like this brown patch, can be a real problem for both uh, bluegrass and finally fescue. And then you look at buffalo grass. Yeah, you know, cutworms are pretty opportunistic. They'll feed on whatever they can and uh, but they're not real common. We we don't have them every year. Sod webworms a little more common, but you know maybe they're not going to be as severe in buffalo grass. And then army worms also very opportunistic, not real common. These chinch bugs are a little more common in buffalo grass, and we do have to deal with those periodically. But much fewer pests in the buffalo grass than we do in the uh, cool season grasses. So. I have another set of questions here. This is about some other plants that might be in our lawns that we might consider weeding. And so mark any of these that you think that are acceptable in your lawn.
And then I also want to jump on here and let people know if they do have questions, feel free to drop them in the Q and A whenever you guys have them and we can try to answer them or well, Ron can because he'll know better than I will. Thank you for mentioning that, Olga. And then I'm gonna also try to give for poll questions about a minute for responses and then we can move on. So, okay, it's almost That's here. Great. Okay. Yes, very nice. And I agree with all of your responses very much. Um, um, white clover works very nicely in lawns and um, wild violets can also. Uh, some of these are a little more invasive than others and dandelions can actually almost, they, they can be pretty hard on particularly on, on our turf grasses. Uh, wild thyme actually works very nicely with lawns. We're gonna cover that one a little bit more. And sandbur, not a lot of fun to have sandburrs in your lawn uh, because they're very prickly. And crabgrass can be, while it doesn't kill your grass, it uh, certainly does compete very strongly with it. Um, and then um, the spiel bindweed, it's, um, it's just a really difficult invasive weed uh, to control and um, does not belong in lawns. And um, so there are some, some of these plants that are fine to have, others you just, you just don't want them. And there are other things that we consider weedy, uh, weedy species that just are not necessarily a problem and we can just deal with those. I'm not necessarily gonna cover those. I just do want to go on and just show you a little bit about uh, weeds that can be a real problem. And uh, so the, the top one on the left, that's the smooth crabgrass or hairy crabgrass, large crabgrass that we could have. There's two different species. And pre-emergent herbicides work very well at controlling these. And uh, you have buffalo grass, it does need to go on a little earlier because the turf does uh, warm up a little faster. And uh, when soil temperatures are above 55 degrees, that's the time to make an application. And usually you can get by with one application. And then the, the one on the top right, that is um, spurge or spotted spurge. There's a couple of different species of it. And the pre-emergent herbicide will keep it away also. And it makes a, this carpet on blanket on top of the grass and it kind of smothers it out. And then the one on the lower left, that is field bindweed. And um, it's uh, very invasive and it can take over your, your, your lawn. And if you put anything else in there, it'll take over that too. It, it'll choke things out. And then uh, the one around the, the right, of course, is our dandelion. And a lot of people do like dandelions. They are very beneficial to pollinating insects, to uh, birds that like to feed on the seeds. And so there are some redeeming factors to dandelions. Also, if you're gonna control these broadleaf weeds or any other broadleaf weeds, very important to control those in early October because you will get so much better control with a herbicide. And usually once you get them, get their populations minimized, all you have to do is spot treat. And even in my, my yard, I have so few of these uh, by just treating in the fall that I just use my pocket knife to get rid of them. And so I really don't have very many of them. Okay, so uh, moving on. So we do mower lawns. And so I just wonder, do people really enjoy mowing their lawns? Or what would they prefer? How often would you prefer to mow your lawn?
Yep, I thought so. Mowing is a chore that's not a lot of fun. And um, with uh, cool season grasses, like the fescues and the bluegrass, uh, once a week. And when you mow, you always want to mow it tall. And the grass actually responds much better if you mow it uh, and keep it, well, the preference is actually to keep it above three and a half inches. But I know some folks would prefer it at two, two and a half inches. That's okay, but do not mow it less than an inch. It just does not do very well. And um, once mowing once a month, um, your, um, your cool season grasses would struggle a little bit with that. You don't want to take any more than a third of the uh, leaf surface off at any one time. And in a month's time, those cool season grasses are probably going to be um, eight to 12 inches tall. And so uh, now buffalo grass, once a month, that's enough. And if you, if you don't like the little seed heads on there, then you can mow it off a little more often than that. But once a month is sufficient. And we're going to talk a little bit here about some alternate grasses or al and alternate turf that you would never have to mow. And so I think that those, or you would just mow once a, once a season if you just want to clean it up. And so we're going to look at those two. All right. So here are some examples of low, no or low mow lawns. And of course, we have our buffalo grass. And, you know, it only gets eight inches, six to eight inches. And um, so most cities are going to accept that tall of a, of a lawn. And I think it's always a good idea when you start doing alternate lawns to let the city know that this is planned and that there are not weeds here. And I know several people here in Hastings who have buffalo grass lawns and they just let it go. And it looks just fine. Now these fine leaf fescues, um, they can also um, be non-mown. They get about eight or nine inches tall. They would tend to kind of lay over a little bit, but it doesn't smother them. And, um, and oftentimes when we are doing fine leaf fescues, we're doing a mix of these. And buffalo grass too, I really like a mix of buffalo grass and blue grama grass because they, they, they work together very nicely and uh, it just gives it uh, more resilience and a little bit better texture when you do that. All right. So some other things that we want to consider. I know folks mentioned that they like white clover. So do I. And uh, you know, I've been, um, I've not had a lot of white clover in my lawn. I'm ready to have it because of all the advantages of it. And you don't have to mow it either. It's going to get about um, eight inches, nine inches, maybe. Um, there is this uh, species called micro clover that doesn't. You don't get a lot of flowers with it. It stays shorter. It's a choice that you might want to look at. And then red clover is a good choice also. And so they don't get very tall. And these all can mix with, with your grasses, um, particularly some shorter grasses, like those fine leaf fescues and um, tall fescues. Um, and then um, this creeping red thyme. I, I don't know if you re recall one of the questions I asked whether thyme belonged in the lawn. And so creeping red thyme is a ground cover that's very short and very um, drought tolerant. And uh, very once you get it going, it just does very well. And um, it's not as, um, doesn't deal with traffic as well as the other three choices here, but you certainly can grow it and it looks very nice. So, you know, there are places to put these different types. If you have a lot of traffic with, with children playing, pets playing, if you have a path that you need to walk on, then um, to grow these others with some of these other flowers in it uh, will be uh, a good thing to do. Whereas if you have a place where, you know, you really don't need to walk, then these, this creep, red creeping time would be a good choice. Odessa was wondering what the sun requirements for the time were. The time is sun. 
you want full sun for time. Yep, there are a few species that go with part shade, and we're going to cover a little bit of that here in a minute. So that's a good question, though. And as I get into these, when I'm talking about lawns, most of these are full or part shade lawns that these plants are good for. And so these are some that are non-grass, additional non-grass choices. And these, these, these plants all are less than a foot. And some are a little taller than others. So this sweet woodruff, it gets about eight, nine inches and um, has very small flowers, makes a nice carpet. Uh, this chamomile is, uh, as you can see, has some really nice flowers on it. And the heads stick up a little bit, but it's only about four to six inches. And then this creeping golden buttons uh, that the foliage there stays at about four inches. And then the moss, and yes, we can grow moss in sunny locations, particularly um, Irish or uh, Scotch moss. And it gets about four inches tall. And they all tend to spread and fill in. And um, you can mow these and then they'll come back nicely. Uh, but this, this is, these are some nice choices for um, either very little mowing or no mowing. And these, these would be choices for maybe once a year mow, mowing here. And, but you would never need to mow moss because it's pretty short. And we're going to look at some other low uh, growing uh, plants in a little bit. So the other thing I wanted the people to think about, we, we already talked about clovers in lawns, but what about just mixing a whole bunch of species? Diversity is a good thing because it, is, uh, it deals with the environmental conditions much better. It provides uh, more habitat for wildlife and it just looks nice. I, I just love the idea of having these different colors in lawns. And so, um, so there's different choices here. We have um, some of this chamomile and some other daisies and some clovers in the top left one. We have some wild violets, excuse me, we have in the top right one, oh, top left, yeah. Um, and then in the lower left, we have some uh, dandelions and some wild violets in with the grass. And then uh, on the uh, top right, we have some clover and some self heal um, in with the grass. And then the lower right, we have self heal, uh, bird's foot tree foil in the grass. And so you can have several species together and it can look really fabulous. Now here are some of the specific species that I just covered. So this one on the upper left is bird's foot tree foil. It's, a, um, it's related closely to your Dutch white clover um, and other clovers, it's a legume. So it does put nitrogen into the ground and um, it left alone, left unmown, it'll grow to about three feet. Uh, but you can mow it and you can mow it at two, in two inches. It does better at three, three and a half inches, just like the rest of these two. And then um, the, the, uh, these, the bird's foot trefoil and the clovers are all introduced species from Europe, whereas the wild violet here below on the left is a native plant. And um, a wild violets can move in and can be a little invasive, but you may like that and it'll spread. Spreading can be good if, uh, if you have a mixed species lawn. All right, here's some additional ones. Uh, you can mix self heal in, and that's what that would look like with just self heal. The one on the upper right, this is wild thyme or creeping thyme. There are several, several species of thyme. And then in the left, Lower left, we have chamomile and we have English daisies. Now I've, I've chosen all of these that fit our, our um, hardiness zone. And here in Nebraska, our zone is uh, zone five and, um, and lower. And um, so we can't really grow things that are in zone six. And I would say under some circumstances, zone five might be a little stretching in zone four, certainly. But um, I've included plants that are hardy in our area. These all do well in shade, or excuse me, in sun 
and in part shade, just like the grasses do. All right, so here's the next question. So what are the mo what's most important in this list to increase beneficial organisms such as bees, butterflies, and birds in our urban environment? Correct. Providing habitat is the most important. Reducing pesticides, extremely important. Um, the others are helpful. The answer could have been all of these are important, but we, I asked, what's the most important in providing habitat? And if, if you have a place for bees, butterflies, and birds, they will come. And you know, I had to think about the bird thing a little bit. So what am I feeding birds here? What makes them beneficial? Well, if I have some insects that come into the lawn or if I have some seeds, better for the birds. So we can provide those. All right, so that brings me to the next topic here is on having bee lawns or flower lawns. And it's similar to the, uh, the mixed species lawn. We're just picking plants that are preferred for um, bees or butterflies. And um, it could be, these could be mixed with grass or they could be by themselves. And so I do, but I do like the mixtures of all of them. And so, um, and I, I took a picture similar to this. I couldn't, uh, unfortunately I couldn't find my picture, but I was at a farmstead south uh, east of Hastings and happened to drive through the lawn, saw that they had a lot of Dutch clover in their lawn. And I saw all kinds of painted lady butterflies in that lawn. And um, so it was just amazing that they were all there feeding and getting nectar from those clover flowers. So what are some choices? And so I found a really good resource, University of um, Minnesota Bee Lab has a really nice piece on creating bee lawns. And so they recommend a certain number of plants for those bee lawns. And so some of these, uh, well, actually these are all native plants right here. And some of them get a little taller than we might like in our lawns, but some of them are not too bad. So the, the, uh, the bottom uh, two on the center and the right, the wild violets and the lance leaf self heal, they only get about five inches. The lance leaf uh, coreopsis gets a little taller, particularly those flower heads. And then the ground plum doesn't get very tall either, about six inches maybe. And then the calico aster, it'll send this, this shoot up here when it's blooming up to about 12 inches. But you know, it looks really nice out there while those are flowering, particularly when you have bees that are foraging on them or when you have flower, uh, butterflies that are coming to visit. And so these are the native plants. And then there are some non-native ones that work very well as also. Now, we're very familiar with the Dutch white clover and, and it's one of our best choices to have out there because it services so many things. And then the next best choice is this creeping thyme. It, and there are so many different types, different colors, um, and they do very well here. Uh, the chamomile also works very nice because the bees really like it. And then uh, the self heal, if you recall, I had self heal in the previous slide here, uh, this lance leaf self heal, that's the native. This is the European version of self heal. And then we have this Siberian squill. And I've been enjoying Siberian squill in my lawn here for the last three weeks. It blooms this beautiful bluish purple color and it's one of the earliest flowers that blooms. So early um, bumblebees that are coming out can utilize this. 
and where there's not a lot of, a lot of other flowering plants. And then it, when it gets hot, then it, it uh, kind of melts back into the, into the, uh, into the turf. So it looks like there's a question and then we can go on to this next one. Yes, so Odessa's wondering, are the Siberian squill a bulb plant? A bulb plant, yes, they are. They're a bulb, but they do spread. Yeah. Okay, so, you know, there are some alternatives to growing grass. And so I, I wanted to talk about that next. So what places do we have where grass lawns actually struggle? And so mark all of these that you think apply. Yep, all of them actually apply these rocky areas, steep areas in particular. Shady areas are tough because grasses don't necessarily like to, gr to grow on them, particularly things like uh, buffalo grass. It does not do well in shade. Uh, dry locations, we have a lot of those. And you know, if we're not irrigating, then we're dealing with those. And then there could be wet locations also. So all of them are correct. So this next section, I would just wanna cover some of the to talk about some of the ground covers that we can actually use in our lawns. And I have them divided up into those that are mobile, steppable, meaning you can walk on them, low growing, and then uh, they, and how they are in sun to shade. And because some of these ground covers don't do very well when you walk on them, and some of them are all right. So here are some that you can actually mow. And these, I've purposely chosen things that are relatively small, short stature. And so things that are, even when the seed heads come out or the flowers come out, they're, they're less than a foot and a half. That's about what they are. And so the foliage is much tighter to the ground, like this white avens, that foliage only gets um, about maybe an inch, inch and a half. And yarrow, it'll send these flower heads out, but the foliage itself, is only about three to four inches. And then, so then we have this lyre leaf sage, just some different choices of things you can make. And so I just, the, the mobile one was pretty short, but there are, are, are these others. These are these steppable ground covers. And these others don't, you, it's a little harder to walk on these. Um, yarrow doesn't take walking on very well. White avens and lyre leaf sage, they're not too bad. But these others, these, these will withstand heavy traffic on them. And you know, I wouldn't say it's a pathway where you're walking through every time, but they will, they will take walking. And then I've divided these up also by how fast they spread. So this Rupert wort is nice, white mazus works very nice, moderately spreading. Whereas fast spreading, here's this Irish and Scotch moss, who knew? And they need either sun or part sun and then this creeping sequin foil works very nice. And then here are some others that um, are either for shade or part shade. And so um, we do have some things that are um, imported from other parts of the world, like these brass buttons come from New Zealand, but they are, have such really cool uh, textures to them and colors. And then this Corsican sandwort is nice and then a juga, um, it works really great in a lot of places. And so these, you know, I wanted you to see some of these that have moderate spread versus the fast spreading ones like this creeping jenny that could almost be uh, invasive. Now there are some species that are less aggressive than others, but sometimes you want these that can be very aggressive and, uh, and do very well. Okay, there's a question, we can get that one. I forgot to mute myself or unmute myself. Um, so the question is from Nicole and she's wondering what are good ground covers hardy enough for dog exercise areas? 
also tolerant to acidity of dog urine. Yeah, those are tough situations. And some of these, even, even these, um, these uh, let's see, these are moderate traffic. These are heavy traffic ones here. These would do better than others. Um, it just depends on how much you get. And if you have a lot of dog traffic, then you might be looking at one of those mixed species lawns with fescue or bluegrass in it. You might do better with those. But I, you know, there's, there's places for these on the edges or where you don't have the, the dogs as, or the pets as often, put these in. You know, we're, I, I think it's really beneficial to have different waves of these different ground covers in and not have something solid it will really increase your interest. And as you plant these out there, there is some differences in how much sun they will take and they'll, some will do better in more or less sun and they'll self-select in those areas. But I would get a plan and say, okay, I'm gonna put these tall ones up against my house and have these ones that do better in shade underneath my trees and then out in the middle, I'm my, where my dogs run, my kids run, I'm gonna put something that has some grass in it or where you walk a lot have some grasses. Now, a lot of these work really well with stepping stones and you could have stepping stones and then plant these in amongst them. So, so here are some that have moderate traffic and moderate spread for sun and part sun. And here, here's that creeping time again. And then this one down here in the lower middle, that's a carnation. And this one, yes, it is a strawberry. And here on the lower right, this is sedum. And there are some sedums that can withstand some traffic. Um, and there's a lot of different types of mesetum, but they, they don't take traffic very well, except for this one. And I find that very interesting that there are some of these alpine ground covers that do pretty well for us. And then um, these are some of the, so the first that we had are, these are all kind of the steppable ones. A lot of these are pretty drought tolerant. Uh, some of them like uh, they, like the um, ajuga, it, it needs a little bit more moisture. It'll do a little bit better, but it'll, it'll survive. It'll just spread slower. And some of these will just spread slower without water. And they, sometimes they could use a little water, but sometimes we can very easily overwater them. So it doesn't really, and usually our, our rainfall that we get is enough. So here are some other low growing um, ground covers that you can use. So these are ground covers that are no more than about 12 to 15 inches. And a lot of them are pretty low. And some of the things that we may not think about. And so I see a lot of creeping flocks. They really, they, they, they'll spread and spill over walls. They work really great in, in uh, along terraces, along the streets, things like that. This snow in summer, it's just look at that carpet that you get. It's a little taller, but it sure looks nice. The pussy toes here has these stems that uh, send the seed heads up flower heads. You can mow these off if you need to. Chamomile looks really nice. Hens and chicks. I mean here, you know, these are not necessarily things that you can walk on, but they certainly have a place out in your, out in your landscape. Now here are some that uh, like part sun or part shade. So like this monkey grass. I mean, it is very tolerant of all kinds of sun and shade and drought and moist. So it, it's a really good choice. And then the, the dwarf, dwarf chamomile also takes either sun or shade. And then the sedums. There are, there are all kinds of sedums that are really great choices. Um, and they, they can withstand some, some shade. They, a lot of them do prefer a little more sun, but all kinds of textures, all kinds of flower colors. There's just lots of different choices there. And then we move into the uh, part sun to part shade. So here we have creeping golden buttons. And they're um, at the end of the season, once these flowers are done, you can mow those off if you want. Um, the, um, these meadow anemones, they just have these nice little nodding heads out there through the, uh, through the year. And a lot of flowers in the spring on those. And then I think a lot of people are familiar with lamb's ear and what, how nice it can look. And it does have a flower head on it that'll sprout out and it'll bloom. And then here we have some that are for part to full shade because we have some of those situations. And um, 
we have periwinkle. Actually, these, these pictures of periwinkle came from my lawn. And you can see here, this is a sidewalk with a fence. And that's a, a strip that's about 10 inches there. And I don't want to deal with it any other way. And so the periwinkle works really well here. It looks nice. Here's some purple mazus that works really nice. And then we can have some lamium that um, also works pretty well in shady areas. It's a little taller than some of the others, but nonetheless, it's still going to work for you. And then here's some more uh, part to full shade. So these wild geraniums, these are also for my lawn. And my wife does a great job of putting these out and taking care of them. And I, I help her, but she, she makes good choices. And I'm learning as I go from her. So wild ginger are good choices. And so is Pachysandra. There's both Allegheny Pachysandra and Japanese Pachysandra. And they all have similar appearances to them. And um, they are relatively drought tolerant and um, do pretty well in the shade. So there is another question. Jason sure. is wondering about your thoughts on Creeping Charlie and ways to get rid of it. Okay. So Creeping Charlie, it's actually a pretty good ground cover, but it's pretty invasive. It'll, if you want grass, it doesn't do, doesn't play, particularly pay, play real nice with grass, but you can mow it, you can keep it short, but it's a mint. And so mints spread. And so you would have to use, you'd either, there, there are basically three ways to get rid of it. You can dig it out, you can burn it out with solarization. We're gonna talk about that here in a minute. Or you can use a, a, a broadleaf herbicide. And if you do it in the fall, very important to do it in the fall, then you can get control of it. But uh, you're gonna wanna probably use um, 2,4-D and, um, a little bit of dicamba, at least as long as it's not underneath trees. Dicamba can be kind of hard on trees. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a tough thing to do. And if, if they want more information about that, they give me a call uh, or e send me an email. We'll, we'll converse that way about it. OK, so the last thing I want to do here to wrap up is how do you get started with these things? Just a few slides to talk about that, because you can't just throw the seeds out on your growing grass, because the grass won't let it grow very well. And so if you're gonna do a mixed species lawn, even if you wanna put Dutch clover or self heal or whatever, you need to follow these directions and, and make it tough on the grass. It, you're not necessarily gonna to need to kill it, but you have to mow it short, you power rake it, you, then you can seed it or plug it, and then you water it. And then you water it so it keeps going well, all right? And then to put ground covers in, this is what solarization looks like in a hot day. You make sure that you have uh, plastic that will kill this. And it takes several months for you to do this. You can also use herbicides. You don't have to till, but it is one way to take care of it. And then you seed or plug. Plugs work really well, but it's more expensive. And then you make sure you water it, particularly in the first year. You need to get these things established. And then mulch is really helpful to get them established. And then you do need to maintain these. There's nothing, there's no ground cover, no landscape that is zero maintenance. And so you'll wanna pull weeds, maybe spot treat some herbicide if, you, if that's acceptable. You may need to apply some water. You may need to do some pruning of them just to get rid of the deadheads and things like that. You may need to divide them and spread them around if they're not spreading like you'd like. And if they are getting out of control, you may need to contain them by putting some kind of barrier down in the ground to keep them from spreading. And But with those things done, you know, usually it's once or twice a year that you have to do this. It's not every week like you deal with lawns. And so you can do these with much less uh, effort and have a much more resilient lawn that's much better for our environment and for our beneficial organisms that are out there. So I think that's the last here. Oh yes, here are some, uh, some information sources and I used these to help me with my presentation. And so um, Nebraska Extension and their turf program, there's a lot of really good extension educators who do community environment and do turf and cover crops. Nebraska Statewide Arboretum is a great resource as are other extension programs from states around us. And then the Missouri Botanical Gardens, 
they have a really great web page that can give you all kinds of information about all kinds of plants. And then I use this gardening know-how. It's a really good web page with lots of information about ground covers and other things. And then the Steppables web page gives you some really nice choices. And these, this is where you can learn what, where to buy some of these things. You can buy some of the seed from um, places that just sell uh, seeds for prairies and things like that. You can, um, uh, a lot of the plants you can buy from local greenhouses. And so things are available for you. All right, so I think that's the end. Yes. Oh, this is off of my, my uh, in my backyard also. So we use ground covers here. So if there are, I see there is one question. If there are any more, I'd be happy, <clears throat> happy to take those. Yes. So Lisa asked, how can I make my snow in summer go away, taking over the bed and that she planted it in shade and sandy soil? Yes, it likes it. Yeah. And, and in the shade, it's probably not doing as well as it probably would in the sun, but you can thin it, you can contain it with um, putting uh, either sheets of metal down in the ground or plastic down in the ground so that the roots won't go underneath of it. You can pull it. Uh, a number of these ground covers are not all that deep rooted. And so there are, there are ways to contain it. You could, if you are willing to do herbicides, you can spray it with some herbicides and that will help thin it. Doesn't always kill it completely. And uh, so there are, there are ways to do that too. And then Lisa was also wondering if there was some kind of like chemical treatment that she possibly could use as well. Yeah, that would be the, the herbicides that you can use. You can use low rates of glyphosate to do that. Um, and it'll, it'll stunt it, but won't necessarily kill it all. And you might kill a few. It's just like in, um, in buffalo grass, you know, you can spray out the, if you want just buffalo grass and not cool season grasses, you can spray out the, the, uh, the cool season grasses with, with uh, a Roundup or other, or glyphosate or other uh, uh, grass herbicides and the buffalo grass will fill right back in. And they should email me too if they want more, I'll, I'll find out more information about the specifics on doing that. Okay, cool. And then I do want everyone to know, I placed up a survey for Conservation Nebraska's records. Um, this is how we make sure that we um, are able to do educational events like this with Ron and a lot of other great community members as well. Um, so please, uh, please make sure you guys go and do this survey as well. There should just be about three questions is all. Um, so yeah, and then also, if anybody has any other questions for Ron, put them in the Q&A and we can get to them. So I'm gonna put my email address in the chat. Let's see, I think if I can, let's see, I'll just use the Q&A. How's that? Is that how I can do it? Um, It would be best if you put it in the chat because then- No, here, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna end the slideshow. Okay. All right, and then, um, so that'll bring up the chat for me. So here is how you can get a hold of me. Make sure I got that right. Yep, ron.seymour at unl.edu. And so there we go. And then we are getting also in the chat, um, people saying thank you, very interesting. I know for one, for myself, I'm, I was interested. I couldn't imagine how many plants that you could use in your lawn. I had no idea. Just, yeah. I, thought, I thought it was probably only going to be a few plants when we originally started this and finding out that how many you can actually use in the lawn is really amazing. It's pretty fascinating, pretty exciting that we can do all those things. And yes, there are some difficulties with some of these plants they get out of hand. And so we may have to dig them out because it's in the, not in a good spot and um, kill the roots with um, 
with a broad spectrum herbicide at the end of the season when the herbicide is going down to the roots. Pretty often that's how you take care of them. Okay, and then we also just have more thank yous. Um, Heidi's talking about how she has some ideas for some lawn flowers now. Um, people excited they got your email address. Um, yeah, thank you guys so much for attending today. Make sure that you get on the survey before you leave. It actually looks like everybody actually has completed the survey now. So that's perfect. Um, yeah, thank you guys for coming out today. Thank you so much, Ron, for putting this presentation together. I know that you and your team were working really hard on it and I appreciate it a lot. We, yep. I know I learned a lot already, so. Good, good. I'm glad. Hopefully we'll be doing more events together in the future. Yeah, I look forward to that.